me. Welcome to the 21st and penultimate episode of the fifth season of the Ubuntu UK podcast. It's Tuesday the 4th of December and in this episode we're going to dot 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 and dot dot dot. Oops. Yes, we need to fill that in. We will of course cover the latest news, events, bit about Ubuntu, tomorrow's technology today and go over your feedback. If you're listening live, hello, you can send us messages using the chat facility on our website and in the IRC channel. I'm Alan and joining me tonight is Tony. Hello. Laura. Hello. And Mark. Hello. Tony, what have you been up to? Um, I can't remember what I wrote down. I went up to... Oh, I was moonlighting That's on, right. uh, on the uh, Doctor in Who... In public. Indeed, yes. <laughs> Actually, yes. Uh, on the Doctor Who podcast. I um, saw you on YouTube. Yes, I was on YouTube and... Oh, you're that Tony Whitmore. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm the internet's Tony Whitmore. I think you'll find. Um, yeah, moonlighting on that and we did a little review. Went to see a, a recovered Doctor Who episode up in London on the weekend. Mm -hmm. So uh, that was fun, hanging out with my Doctor Who friends. Much cooler than Ubuntu friends, obviously. Um, and I also <laughs> just bought... Might as well go home. <laughs> <laughs> I also uh, managed to get hold of a Nexus 4. Ooh. Where is it? I can't see it. Not that looks like an HTC hands. hero you have there. <laughs> a very battered and worn <laughs> HTC hero. Uh, it will be here in one to two weeks, according to Google. Oh, right. Cool. So it was, went back on sale again today. Are you going to give that away on the podcast? Five, five. Nope. Oh. I'm going to give away the battered HTC hero. <laughs> With all your it's not on. yours. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Alan might want it back. <laughs> Excellent. Laura, how about yourself? What have you been up to? I went to a bike maintenance workshop. Really? And, and how is your back? Bike. Oh, I see. Bicycle. Uh, yes. What did you learn? I learned how to adjust the gears on my bike, mm -hmm. uh, how to take it, the wheel off and remove the tyre, deflate it, reinflate it, everything. Uh, clean the old the brake. Oh, I filed my brake blocks. <laughs> Right, like you do. So, yeah, I think the most, the bit I was most proud of was tweaking the gears because it just sounded like a complicated thing to do, and it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, was it, was this like a night school kind of thing? It was a two hour workshop at a bike place in RideRide dot co dot uk in Southampton, um, and it was subsidised by Sustrans, which I think is a charity na national charity for sustainable transport. Oh right, were there many people there? Was it one on one or? There were about four of us there, I think. Men, women, mix. Half oh, right. and a half. Cool. So that was really cool. Useful. You feel confident fixing your own bike now? Yes. Would you fix someone else's bike? No. <laughs> Damn it. It was a very basic one, though. Ah, cool. Mark, how about yourself? What have you been up to? Well, always uh, keen to keep up with the latest trends. I started playing Minecraft. You started? Uh, yes. Two and a half years after everybody else. Yes. <laughs> Excellent. Did well you done. build so a pig or whatever it is you're supposed to do? I, I punched trees. I, yeah, I hit some pigs. And and kept on falling in lava and burning all my stuff until I worked out that if I jump out of the lava, then I drop it somewhere. It doesn't all catch fire when I die. Oh, okay. And uh, I've, I've uh, yeah. It means nothing to me. Built some houses and abandoned them in favour of a house I haven't built yet. <laughs> Do you see you can get Lego Minecraft? Yes. They have to yeah. make the Lego more blocky. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Awesome. Um, right. And I also donated to Wikipedia. Oh. Me too. Why? Just to get rid of those annoying banners. Well, no. If you if <laughs> does you, it get rid of them? If you know, if you just you don't have to you don't you don't have to donate. You just have to log in, and then you don't see them. Uh. But I thought I uh, use it every yeah. day. Why not give them a fiver each month? So I did. I just gave them a tenner. Fair enough. Wow. So Alan, the second most popular pontifex on Twitter. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what have you been doing? Bless you. Uh, <laughs> I, I went to the post office to um, to post a podcast prize. Oh, right. Okay. We haven't done a competition recently, have we? No. <laughs> no, this is a prize that's been sat on a shelf that I uh, I kind of neglected to post before I went to Copenhagen for UDS. Ah, that sounds it, most unlike you. And then again, neglected to post it when I got back. Um, right. and but so, this has never happened before, has it? Surely. <laughs> one or two times, <laughs> yes. Uh, it goes into the shelf of interesting things and stays there. <laughs> right. Uh, and, well, it was what was most interesting about it was the fact that I posted it and then discovered I posted it to the wrong person, <laughs> which was kind of annoying given yes. I'd actually wrapped it up really really nicely <laughs> and, and then walked around the post office you know really being happy and <laughs> having a stroll and I thought I was almost going to send you a text from the post office <laughs> or a tweet with a photo of me handing the parcel over <laughs> I wanted to take a photo of the guy like yeah. accepting my parcel uh, but I decided not to and then so but we made sure the right person got it as well and then within minutes Tony sent an email <laughs> yeah saying have you sent that post that parcel yet yes, yes. you sent it to the wrong 
one person. Yes, whoever, whoever thought we might be a professional outfit, <laughs> clearly deluded. Clearly well, two deluded. people got a prize. Brilliant. Yeah, absolutely. congratulations. Excellent. Yeah, well Double done, both bubble. of you. Yes. Uh, let's not go into... That uh, won't happen again. Yeah. <laughs> We've seen people and companies looking at uh, alternatives to Android, Windows, and iOS. We've got uh, Jolla, who, which is made up from... Yola. Your Yola? Oh, the Finnish, Finnish isn't it? Yes. yes. Uh, made from uh, ex Nokia employees. <laughs> made, made from... from mashed up. <laughs> <laughs> is that what Nokia did? <laughs> um, we've got Tizen, is it? Or Tizen? I'm never yes, sure. Tizen. Tizen, yes, Tizen. Tizen, like Tizer with an N. From, from Intel. Intel. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, Bada from Samsung. Bada. Bada. From Samsung. <laughs> um, and we've also seen independent crowdfunded projects offering alternatives. So is crowdsourcing the way to fund competition to Android, Windows and iOS? Or does it have to have a big company like Nokia or Intel behind it to make it a success? Mm, okay. So crowdsourcing. Hands up on this podcast if you've been hands up. That's going to work. Podcasted well. uh, if you've uh, crowdsourced something, been involved in a crowdsourcing thing. Tony, okay. Laura, and uh, no, not Tony. Oh dear, that did that That's narration Alan. didn't work. Sorry, Alan, Mark, and Laura put their hands up. So three out of four <laughs> of you have been. So what sort of things have you been involved in crowdfunding, sourcing, whatever it's called? I've crowdfunded some music projects. Okay, what sort of things like albums or something? Yes, triple albums. Triple albums. Wow. So yes. somebody wants to go into a studio, they need funding to pay for the studio time in advance. Yeah, basically, they um, uh, artist called Ginger Wildheart, who doesn't have a record deal. He just has a lot of musicians that he knows. So he wanted to essentially hire a studio, pay them, pay all his mates as session musicians, record it, give away any extra money to charity, and put the album out. So in this case, his fans are paying a certain amount of money up front to help fund the making of the album, yeah. and then what? what and they, they get a reward. They, they get, get the, the, al- the They album, basically say, they? "I will buy the album regardless of what it sounds like." So, so here's the money up front. It's just kind of pre, pre-paying, pre-paying, yes, yeah, pre-ordering. Okay, but before the thing exists, in some cases, right. sometimes it's after the thing exists. So you know, all the R and D work has already been done, and you know, the 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 thing exists, but they just need to ramp up production. Mm. It, it, they're all in different stages. All these 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 um, crowdsource projects, right? Some of them don't exist at all, other than engineering drawings or something. So, yes. what sort of things have you? Um, backed mostly tangible items that people will post to me at some point <laughs> as opposed to as opposed to competition uh, prizes <laughs> <laughs> uh, so one one that i'm quite looking forward to getting is one called uh it's a book called i draw comics mm-hmm. and it's a book that shows you how to draw comic characters and and stuff as okay. you go through so you can like actually follow along with the book and actually write comics oh. um and a few others as well there's a, a an engineering toy for girls that i thought my daughter might like um, is it pink? It's got pink bits. Mm. It's also got blue bits. So, so why is it not for boys? Because uh, <laughs> there's plenty of boys in engineering. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> ah. yeah. Uh, so yeah, most most of them are techie type things. I okay. think that I've done. Did you get the pebble? No, I think that was before my time on Kickstarter. Yeah. I didn't really follow that. Uh, so so if something has reached a target or its period of bids has closed you can't get involved in it no well so there's a there's a period of time uh, it depends there's a number of different ways of doing it. if you use the official kickstarter there's one way there's one called indiegogo and there's loads of others starting up but right. then some companies do their own they say it's crowdsourced for example app.net the twitter comparison thing yes uh they did their own crowdsource thing but they didn't use any third-party sites they did it all on their own page right and okay. there was one there was one company who um, Kickstarter wouldn't let them on their site, so they wrote and open sourced their own crowdfunding site system. So you can <laughs> That's now way to do it. Yeah, you can now download their system if you want to run your own crowdfunding site. Right. So there's loads of different ways to do it, and often uh, the when the period of time ends, if the amount of money hasn't been raised, then nobody gets their money, and you probably don't get the product. Right. Um, or the product may not get developed as fast or at all. So, um, so at what point do you part with your money? When uh, so at the end of the crowdfunding, they uh, if the goal has been reached, mm. then uh, they can then take the money and make the thing. And uh, 
So I, I see a website for a widget of some sort, mm-hmm. and it's asking for, let's say, $10. Um, and I commit to giving $10 at the end of the fundraising window, yeah. which yes. might be a couple of months. But you give if your, enough, fi- you give your had, financial details. Yeah. It's not like a, a right. pledge. It's not like a phone-in where you pledge and, and then you might actually give the money or you might not. It, right. They actually take your details and will take your money when the time comes. Yeah. Okay, yeah. assuming you don't cancel your credit card in the in-between. Yeah. Yeah. And assuming that enough other people say, I will also give £10. Okay, so there's a threshold. They and, have and, to reach their target by the end, otherwise they don't get anyone's money. It's, it's very much like the way you help finance ORG. Right. I'll give five pounds if, if a thousand other people give five yeah. pounds. Effectively, okay. that's like the simplest term, where there's only one amount of money you need to specify, and there's a fixed number of people who who um, contribute. Whereas with Kickstarter, it can, they they often have different bands, so you could just give one dollar and you'll get nothing but the gra- the gratitude that you contributed. Right. Or you could give like a thousand dollars, and they might fly you out there and have dinner with the people who are making the thing. Okay. You know, they all yeah. but they all set their own level. But you're not actually right. you're never actually buying the thing. You're contributing to the the campaign and then as a reward you get yeah. a thing in return i'm sure there's some tax reason for yeah. doing it that way <laughs> it, sounds, it sounds a bit like Ogcamp, where we ask for donations to get in <laughs> to get a t-shirt yeah yes. you get a yes. free mug yes exactly. <laughs> it's, exactly, yeah. it's exactly the same kind of scam i mean deal uh, you're right okay <laughs> so it's not just um technical things there's lots of books out there now and um, mm. robert, robert llewellyn off of red dwarf wrote a whole novel which was very good and i actually missed the the crowdsourcing part of it um but Dr. Black, who saved Bletchley Park with other people, um, has written a book about saving Bletchley Park, or is writing a book, and she's crowdsourced the funding for that, and I think she's hit 150% or something. Um, so, uh, Sue Black, I think we did Sue interview Black, yeah. uh, uh, last season, season before yeah. maybe, about Bletchley Park. Um, so, I, one of the things I have heard is that you get these projects that massively overreach their targets. Mm. So, for example, the, the game console, Ouya, or however you pronounce it, O-U-Y-A, yeah, they okay. had a target of nine hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and by the end of the the period, they got eight and a half million dollars. Wow! So yeah, yeah somewhat oversubscribed. The, yeah, the first album I did, it doesn't. In fact, on Pledge Music, which is the site I used, um, or rather, Ginger Wildheart used, um, it doesn't actually tell you the amount of money that the, the artist is asking for. It just tells you the percentage of the total they've reached. Right, and uh. so that project reached um, about five hundred and seventy percent of its target, which I yeah yeah that's what Unbound do. So saving Bletchley Park's one hundred and fifty seven percent. Okay, so so yeah, there's a lot of these that are hardware. There's, there's books, there's music, but yeah, you know, there's a fair number of them that are hardware devices. Mm. And we mentioned one a little while ago, the um, a phone that um, Next Phone. Yeah, it? Next Phone. It was on Indiegogo, and it didn't make anywhere near the target. No, it made about oh. what. Hundred dollars or something. Else. It was like three thousand dollars out of nearly a, a million. million. Yeah. So, what governs whether a project will drastically exceed its target or, um, you know, fail miserably? Well, I think the the real difference between something like um, the Peng Pod, which is one we talked about last week, which has passed its target and gone past it by quite a way, and something like the Next Phone is with the Peng Pod. They said look at these tablets that we've got in our hands. We're running Linux on them. We just need to sort out the last few bits and get them shipped. Whereas um, next phone was basically some nice concept art. Mm. And, and the other thing, the, the perks with Peng pod were, if you were, if you donate this much, then we'll give you one of the devices. Whereas with next phone, there was no offer of actually ever getting a device for the money. So we basically wanted a million dollars for in exchange for some concept art right so <laughs> well the the theory was that it would get made at some point and then it would be a, something that you could buy but yes. yeah you were you were funding the development of the thing and rather then, than yeah. rather than the manufacture and production and distribution yeah. which is what you're doing with the pain pod yeah. so you'd you'd fund it and then pay again to buy it in the future if it yeah. succeeded yeah, and you might get you might get early doors or a deal. You know that that wasn't clear. No, but there was the, there the wasn't actually it, any any concrete offer of what you'd get in the long run. You might get yeah. to yeah. I mean, a high risk like, one. Yeah, it was. That's that's probably it. It was high risk. Whereas ones like um, there was a, a one that I funded on um, Kickstarter was the ostrich pillow. Oh yes, yes, which I saw, I saw on TV. Stephen Fry's Gadget Man show oh, really? had, had it on. Yeah. They haven't even sent them out to backers yet. Well, they have to Stephen Fry. Yeah, there's a few. There's been on a few TV programs. It's kind of getting. What is it? Uh, it's um, Alan a, shows a, laptop oh, to Laura. Yeah. It's a pillow 
Well, it's, it's more like a snood thing. <laughs> you, put, you pull over your head and do you know it covers your eyes because it's nothing like one of those. A snood is a, like a thing you pull over your head. It's like a yes. like a tube. It's a, no, it's not. It's a scarf which doesn't have an end. Yes, yes, so yes. Pull yes. Pull yes. Pull it's a, it's a, it's back, okay. back it's a in tube. the 80s, Mark, we used to do this. We used to pull <laughs> snoods over our heads. Okay. So, t- so it's a tube you, know, you, you pull know. over your head, it covers your eyes, and it's got two holes. You put your hands in, you put your head on the desk, and you go to sleep. You look a lot like uh, Monica, was it, off of Friends with a turkey, oh, with the turkey on the head? On head. Oh, yes. yes. Yeah. So I the, suspect that was the inspiration. The thing, the thing that got me with that one is they had a, a kind of um, early bird thing where they they had a limited number of backers i think it was only 300 yeah. if you pledge the absolute <laughs> lowest and you get one early whereas uh, uh, um, whereas if you pledge more you know you might get you might be in the second round production round or something like that so there are, there are some where your the motivation if your motivation is not just to fund the thing but to actually have one of the things mm. then you know you're you're going to be more motivated to to stick your money in it. If, yeah. if there's a nice early doors, you know, I really. If you're a kind of impatient person like me, whereas if for the for the phone, that next phone, yeah, because there was a hey, no way I was ever going to get one by pledging to it, mm. you know, yeah. directly that, and there was no early backer kind of thing. It was kind of well, I'll just sit and so wait. And this not... d- this doesn't give you any kind of ongoing stake in the company. It's no. literally no. just no. A, a, a cash injection for them, and you yeah. get something yeah. back in return. And probably, you get the fuzzy maybe. feeling that you may have you know helped someone. Uh, bootstrap a business of some kind okay you know well victor 1998 is listening live and he's commenting in the rc channel saying it could take your money and there's no guarantee you'll get anything in the end it's kind of no guarantee of getting a physical product that sometimes happens yeah yeah in fact okay. andy piper friend of the show indeed has uh, been uh, moaning about this on twitter a bit this week because he's had a bit of trouble with some of the projects that he's backed right not shipping or not shipping very quickly mm. Right. Yeah, there was one that sh- that um, that raised their target back in March this year, mm. and they still haven't shipped the item. Uh, it was the cloud. What's it called? The egg. Air quality egg. Air quality yeah. egg right. thing. Yeah. And Andy then... Piper invested in something called an air quality egg. <laughs> yes. Yeah, right. It cool. It looked cool. That's the thing. You know. Yeah. Right. Okay. That's the main thing. Uh, yeah. If he wants to buy an egg from me for fifty quid, then <laughs> I'm sure I can you'll guarantee it's air quality. Will you? <laughs> I, I will, I'll, I'll, I'll drive it up to his house. So I don't know if if these will uh, these I mean, they they work for some things and they also work well for games. Yeah, especially games where people have a proven track record of creating games. In Although the past. saying that, we um, we mentioned in the news a few weeks ago about Elite Dangerous, the new yes. remake of, and that's got a month to go, but it's only reached half of its target. Yeah, true. Uh, some of them do have a, uh, a you know a spurt towards the end, you know, much like an eBay auction. You know, mm. they kind of. I think if you've got some credibility behind you, that helps. Like the Robert Llewellyn one, he's written books before. You've got a fair chance he's going to write it. Yeah, but surely the, the advantage of this sort of system is that you don't have to have a track record to get your product to market. If you had a good track record, you're probably more likely to be able to go to a publisher. Yeah. And get your thing published. But you may not want to. You may not want to use that system. Yeah. Some of, some sure. of the, some of the games that are published via these systems or advertised via these systems um, or funded um, often don't want to go via that that mechanism because of the restrictions that are imposed, you know, on their creativity, darling. Right, uh, yeah. and so they'd rather be in total control of the thing that they're creating themselves. Okay, it's a bit like the uh, Kevin Smith thing. Going the way your own film, marketing his own film by just mm. taking the old route and going around America with it. Right. Um, but then he's going to help new people get on board using his name because they don't have the name already. So. Okay, so if people are vaguely interested in finding out more about this sort of crowdsourcing funding thing, um, where should they start? I, I would browse Kickstarter and Indiegogo. And unbound.co.uk. And pledgemusic.com. Wow, we should put links to all of these. In the show notes. Let me write yeah. them down while I remember. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay, and... What sort of amount are you talking about to get involved? Is it like a dollar well, or the minimum on some of them is one dollar? But you right. don't get anything um, for that. Well, the the so for example, the Ouya, the game console, the minimum was ten dollars, and the reward was you get to select your own username. So if you ever do uh, buy one, you know some people okay. like to have their own game tag nickname <laughs> in cool. in their uh, online system, so they you know you can reserve your own nickname. But then it goes up to having like badges or emblems or you know things like. Um, Actually, then, then there's actually getting the device, and then uh, a special version of the device, or a developer version of the device, or and then, knitted socks, or you know, or um, or there's you know, for this one, there was if you pledge five thousand uh, dollars, 
um, we'll put you up in a San Francisco, a San Francisco for a day with you know the people who designed the thing. So it, it depends, you know, how how passionate you are about wanting the thing to succeed, whatever it is, and how much money you've got to, you know, throw mm. at something speculatively. Well, if you're listening at home and have got any thoughts about crowdfunding and whether it's a good idea or a bad idea or and, somewhere in between, and whether we could use it for Ubuntu, I know it's been yeah. speculated whether or OGCam <laughs> <laughs> or UUPC. <laughs> oh yes, definitely. Um, We've got we'll, lots of postage to pay. We'll do another season for only ten thousand pounds each. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, but you can email in podcast at ubuntu-uk.org. It's time for the news, and Mozilla Engineering Manager Benjamin Smedberg has decided to disable 64-bit builds of Firefox for Windows. The re- reasons cited included lack of plugin support and lack of resources assigned to 64-bit development, leading to user frustration. Users currently running the 64-bit edition will be automatically migrated to the 32-bit version, which will still run on the 64-bit operating system. There was a bit of uproar, and mm-hmm. some people complained and said, well, why don't you just leave them enabled for you know, a point in time in the future when we do have the engineers available to do the QA and the testing and, you know... Get have the kind of unsupported releases. Yeah, yeah, just let it build. Um, you know, because it's already building, why not just carry on letting it build? Um, but uh, no, they kind of just said, nope, we're not building it. Is the advantage of a 64-bit version that it can address more than four gigs of memory? That's quite a lot for that's a browser. A lot of tabs. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and also keeping only uh, 64-bit clean, so you're only using 64-bit oh, yeah, libraries. So you don't, need you don't have to have like compatibility a, layer. a 32-bit version of a library and a 64-bit version of a library in memory at the same time. Yeah. Oh, well, that if counts. it's only for Windows, I don't care. <laughs> well, there is that. Yeah. <laughs> a new version of the GStreamer SDK has been released, including support for GStreamer on Android. The release aims to allow production of Android apps with advanced multimedia capabilities. And the uh, SDK supports Android 2.3.1 and up, although hardware-accelerated features will only be available from Android 4.1. So should this make it easier for people to port apps across from normal Linux to Android Linux? I suppose so. Jakosha on the (laughs) Nexus 7. (gasps) Yeah. Get on it, Jono. (laughs) (laughs) Mozilla has started shipping builds of Firefox for Android supporting H.264 video streaming. The move comes after Mozilla's policy change earlier this year in which it decided to support the patent-encumbered codec when it was already present on user systems. Mobile devices support H.264 through hardware codecs, but future releases will add support on desktop releases through software codecs as well. That's pretty good, isn't it? Hmm, I think so. So that would mean you could do um, YouTube with the HTML5? Yes. Although most mobile devices detect you're on YouTube and redirect you to an app, usually, but yes. you could do it directly in the browser. Yeah. And when you've got, um, I think it's, is it GStreamer on Linux or something else, mm-hmm. which has, yeah, so if basically if you pass off yeah. to the codec. Yes, exactly. So therefore install. they don't have to build the codec into the browser. They right. just use what's already there. And therefore that makes total that's sense. sort of still within there. It's all evil, but it makes total sense if a person's already gone through the hoops of yeah. having the codec on their system or it's already built into the hardware. Why not use it? Exactly. Yeah. Wow. I'm glad you understand that. <laughs> An Austrian man has been arrested and charged after his server running a Tor exit node was used for sharing child pornography. William Weber had his house raided by police and his hardware confiscated and is currently awaiting trial. Facing up to 10 years in jail if convicted, he's requested donations to allow him to hire a lawyer to fight his case. So this isn't cool. No, so it's quite scary, isn't it? sucks it? quite a bit. Explain what a Tor exit node is. So <laughs> Tor is the, the onion router. Uh, which allows people to browse the internet uh, without people knowing what IP address they originated from. Yeah. So it's basically it's um, a sort of proxy network which sends your traffic around several servers in an right. encrypted form. So well, basically it looks like the traffic to the destination is coming from wherever it exits that network. So this guy hasn't been downloading child pornography no. himself. No. Uh, well, and he's probably, not accused probably. of that. Yeah. And he's not... Right, but he's being held responsible for the actions but of the machine. machine. He's being responsible for distributing it because his machine accessed it, essentially. Right, yeah. A machine he was in control of, despite him not originating the packets because they came through Tor and then left at the exit point that was on his machine. Yeah, and we have laws in this country that do something similar, make the ISP, or the Internet Service Provider, um, 
whether that's a company or a, you know, a big organization like a university or whatever, responsible for what happens on that connection. Mm. And same, mm. same for home. If you, if you left your wireless access point open or, um, and someone you know, sat outside your house or in a coffee shop over the road from your flat and accessed your, your network right. and then you know, did something dodgy, it's entirely possible that some police could you know, raid your house and take away all your equipment. Which is a massive waste of their resources. Yes, <laughs> and it seems from from his account that, that when he when he spoke to the authorities, they kind of understood and yeah. got got what he was talking about and understood it. But the problem is, they now have to go through the whole process, mm. and the chances are he probably will never get his equipment back. And, and he'll have he, a criminal record. Well, yeah. no, even if he's acquitted. Oh yeah. Yeah, you know, even if he's not charged, and you know, it it, it will have cost him a boatload of lawyers and yeah, and, and he's lost time all his and computer equipment yeah. and tarnished his name. You know. Yeah. But it's a case that needs to be seen and needs to be made more public so you know in some ways it's a good thing because on the positive side people are now more aware of tour and more aware of the implication of running a tour exit node yeah hmm. Hmm. indie city a distribution and achievements portable for independent games has announced that it is planning to release for linux and is seeking launch titles cool oh this is uh, indie city it's like Steam and Desura, isn't right? It? Yes, I thought it looked like that sort of thing. Yes, but so it's for like a game only, portal only for indie titles. Yes, like Humble Bundle is only for indie games, except for the new one. Oh, yes, mm. good stuff. Okay, that's the end of the news. Cool. And we have an event. Ooh. Tell us about the event. Okay, the Hacker Public Radio New Year Party is happening. When uh, is it? It is starting on Monday the. Dis- Monday the 31st of December 2012 That would make sense, being a New Year party At 12 o'clock UTC, so midday uh, And running until 12 o'clock on Tuesday the 1st of January So 24 hour party, people <laughs> Join the live session in the Hacker Public Radio room On mumble.openspeak.cc And port 64747 <laughs> Maybe in the show notes, I imagine Or listen along to the live stream So Ken Fallon has emailed in to ask us to promote this yep. And he wants genuinely wants people to come along and, and yep. listen to them talk on New Year's and Eve And join in as well And join in It's really yes. easy, you just uh, install Mumble Point it at uh, their server, mumble.openspeak.cc On that port 64747 and you join the channel and you can chat with them and they're recording it and then they'll put it out as a as a show um, shortly after. Cool. cool. So if your social life is somewhat lacking, you can spend some time with talking other people. to other people whose yeah. social lives are somewhat lacking. <laughs> Aww. <laughs> Meow. I'm sure it'll be great fun, Ken. Lots of people don't like you. Says the man with a recording studio in his front room. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> talking to internet people. Touche. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to Tomorrow's Technology Today. I'm Douglas Austin Cambridge. Good day to all our listeners, wherever you are around the British Empire, or indeed, Licky N. Good day, Dublin. That will be our hasty hostess, Miss Didri Morris Oxford. And why are you in such a hurry this fine day? We have a guest, and he's bringing in his latest invention. Why, certainly we do, Deirdre. None other than my old school chum, the noted explorer, Major Herbert Maxwell Fosdyke Curmudgeon. And that splendid invention you can hear is... Well, Major, why don't you tell us about it? Top hole, old boy. Yes, this is my new all-terrain vehicle. Dashed expensive, I can tell you. Why is that? Mostly for the 200 pairs of army boots it moves about on. Wouldn't caterpillar tracks be more efficient? This is a British expedition. What does efficiency have to do with it? What do you call it, Herbert? I call it my slow mobile. Going to take it up the Amazon next month. There's no snow along the Amazon, Major. Well spotted, girl. I like the cut of your petticoat. Perhaps I could take you up the Amazon, my dear. Oh, Major Curmudgeon, I couldn't possibly. How exciting. I'll start pecking. Snow, swamp, sand, it's all the same to me in the mobile. This is the final test before we take it up the Andes in search of the abominable snowman. Isn't the abominable snowman in Nepal? Wouldn't it be easier simply to fly, Herbert? In an aeroplane? Like those damned sissy boys in the RAF? 
unsafe, unsound. It's madness, I tell you. No son of mine will be joining the RAF. Your brother Gordon is in the RAF, isn't he? He crashed. But he survived. He's being looked after by your wife in Chipping Sodbury. Gordon's alive? Gah! Uh, so what do you intend to do with the abominable snowman when you find him, Herbert? Bag him and stick him in London Zoo where he belongs, Florence. You promised you wouldn't call me that, Herbert. We're not at school anymore. Ha 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 ha! Right, that's it. I've just about had it. Douglas! Douglas, put down that bottle of salt! Douglas, where's your medication? Oh dear. Well, that's all from tomorrow's technology today. Toolpit and God save the king. got to wondering over our tea and cake why do we do this <laughs> that's a good question yeah, i wonder that every time i drive down here. <laughs> uh, so we and many other people spend a lot of our hours voluntarily working on ubuntu um, but what is it about ubuntu that's so appealing and why ubuntu and not some other open source project and why ubuntu and not going to the pub hmm okay right so why why? <laughs> Why? <laughs> Why? It's, it's a good question. A, well, the, the you know the usual developer answer is to scratch an itch, isn't it? It's you know I created this thing yeah. and I wanted to solve a problem, so I solved it, and I'm putting it out there so other people can use it, or because I want help with it. I'm not that itchy. <laughs> well, well, um, okay, yes, you are. You're itchy in the hospital department. You quite like <laughs> you quite like <laughs> <laughs> theme, theme hospital. Yes. So, you know, the, kind of the guys who created Theme yeah. Hospital want to scratch an itch. They wanted to be able to play Theme Hospital on a modern computer. Yes. So it's that, that kind of thing. And they wanted to get it out there so that other people can contribute as well. I think that at a at really base level, that's what most people... Same with, like, Linus. Yeah. You know, I've created this thing. It won't be very big and, you know, but here it is anyway. I mean, he's one of those people who's turned it, a hobby into a living. Mm-hmm. And I can sort of understand the people who, you know, get a full-time job out of it, continuing to do stuff. But Yeah, um, Alan. Yeah. yeah, <laughs> yeah. But, but, but it's a good po- case in point. Al- Alan has a full-time job doing stuff around Ubuntu, which he won't tell us. Um, <laughs> but then again, you also... But, oh, sorry, Tony, you carry on. I won't interrupt you quite yet. No, you can finish my point if you would like. <laughs> I'm not sure if it was the same sentences. one. Um, the point is, but you still do this and you still do uh, some other activities in the Ubuntu community. Yes, and you still spend several years before you got the job doing a lot of stuff around Ubuntu. Are you normal <laughs> in canonical? Oh, well. Uh, <laughs> uh, two I mean, very different... Is it, I can understand why people working on Ubuntu wouldn't want to work on Ubuntu in the evenings, maybe, but is that... Do people find that, or...? Um, it depends. There are, you know, you, you've got... Um, okay, so there are people who are... Um, working on open source or working in open source projects because they're aiming to get for a career option in that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or they're working on it because it just scratches an itch and it's something that has a hobby and is an, you know, a complete aside to what they do on a daily basis or because they just enjoy it, you know. Um, for me, it was I just enjoyed it. I quite enjoyed doing it. And then there was the opportunity to go and work for them and, and, and so on. Um, and there are quite a large number of people who work for Canonical who are in inverted commas, from the community. Yeah. So you've got people like um, Sebastian Backer, Didier Roche, um, and Stefan Graeber, who work for Canonical, but were in the community beforehand and are very passionate about community. And now now they work at Canonical, they still are passionate about the community. And they're, That's they're, good. They, they still, you know, decisions they make and um, their actions within the company are still always conscious of the community impact and making sure that what they do is, um, you know, in in unison with what the community want. Um, that, that, that's not the case for everyone, of course, because yeah. some people didn't come from the community. Some people were hires from outside, you know, people who were companies we bought or, you know, we acquired or whatever. So, um, so what was it about Ubuntu rather than Debian 
for example? Why why, are you, why did you start contributing to Ubuntu rather than Debian? It's not all about me, is it? No, um, but <laughs> yeah, well, let's do you first. All right. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I've said this before. I got into Ubuntu because Hugo told me Ubuntu was quite good, and it and um, I had a look at it and I agreed it was quite good. And right. and I got into the community side of it because it was. I found it easier to get into and easier to contribute to Ubuntu than Debian. I found mm. Debian very abrasive back in 2004. Right. Um, and I found it you know, almost impossible to get involved as someone who isn't, as a, isn't a developer. Whereas in like 2005, six, I was providing support um, for new users and answering technical questions, which is something that I wouldn't even have thought of doing. I mean, if yeah. Ubuntu hadn't come along, maybe I would have contributed to Debian. I don't know. Yeah. Mm. Um, Mark, what about you? Um, well, I suppose with Ubuntu specifically, I sort of it came out just as I was getting into Linux. I was into open source for a bit before I started actually using Linux, but I was sort of playing around and I'd I'd used some Debian, other Debian based stuff, and the way that De that Debian worked made a lot of sense to me in right. terms of you know apt and in the installer and things like that. Um, but I sort of wanted something that was a bit less horrible <laughs> from a usability point of view and Ubuntu seemed to be trying to do that. So I started using it and it had Kubuntu as well, which was basically the best KDE-based distribution there was. Okay, but why not go and um, join a theatre group or... Um, play in a band or... <laughs> ah, now play, play in a band, that's a good one, because that's something which I did for a bit. Okay, so, and you did student radio and things and as well? And I did well. student yeah. radio. So how come you ended up spending a lot of your free time doing Ubuntu stuff, or at least some of it, as opposed to being in a band or being on the radio? I think the reason that I spend a lot of time doing Ubuntu is because Ubuntu I can do on my computer and I don't have to rely on other people for me to be able to do things. Whereas yeah. when you're in a band, you have to get a group of people together and you have to keep them all motivated. And is, is that not something that has to happen in a Linux distribution? It, it, is, something that has to, it is something not that has to... Not for an individual. That's the thing. I, I mean, there's a, there's a massive community and if I want to, you know, do some coding, then I can just turn on my computer and do some coding. But if I want to play a song with the rest of my band, I have to make sure that they're all going to be in the rehearsal studio on that day and they're all going to be able to pay for it, and they're all going to have their instruments with them. Have you not seen those people who have like the big drum on their back and the <laughs> cymbals on their knees? They don't need anybody else. <laughs> they do. Trust me, they do. <laughs> so I, I'm the, I, I, answering your your question about why not a theatre group or a band. A, I can't play any musical instruments, but. Um, Ignore the, the reason... talent barrier for a minute. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it does anyway. Well, that doesn't stop me now, does it? Um, <laughs> the, in terms of not doing something else, um, I am similar to many other geeks in that um, terrifically shy, not very particularly socially um, brilliant, and okay. sitting behind a screen and typing at people is tremendously easier than going out and talking to people in the big, big blue room mm -hmm. and and especially <laughs> talking <laughs> standing on a stage um, i've somewhat overcome some of that over the years i, I, I was gonna artist, say yeah. <laughs> but yeah i know it's all a front oh, right, okay. <laughs> wow it's getting quite deep yeah and personal yeah. So, so and i think that's that, that's the case for a lot of people there's also that that um feeling that you can contribute and nobody will judge you based on things like what you look like mm. so the color mm. of your skin your sex you can anybody comes hide uh, via a, a nickname of some kind mm. you can um you, you can have any sexual orientation and nobody nobody really cares it's not it's not something that matters the so long as you can, as long as you can write code or mm. you know support people or translate or do something that is worth contributing i think that's why a lot of people get into it is it's a it's a way to do something worthwhile without having the the, the social problem of other people actually seeing you and making judgments based on you know what you look like, for example. And fitting it around things, as you say, you don't have... To, well, aside from a podcast, you don't have to be in the same room at the same time as everybody else. Yeah. Well, even for a podcast, you don't have to. We choose to. Yeah. Um, 
but yeah, you can you can sit at home after you've done whatever work that you've done. You know, you look at someone like um, Neil Wallace, who by day is a dentist, yeah, uh, and then goes home and writes you know cute software in the evening. Uh, not you know, cute software. I mean, yeah. like QT. QT. Yeah, cute software <laughs> in the evening. And you know, that's. It, I'm, I'm sure that some of that is an escape. The fact that he's writing dental software doesn't mean he escapes very much. But <laughs> <laughs> Scratching an itch. Yeah, exactly. Or drilling a cavity, as he likes to call it. <laughs> Nicely done. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think there's the, the there's the whole scratching itch and and you know getting something out of something you you don't do during the day. Laura, how about you? It's a good question. Yeah, so you've had quite a few minutes to prepare for it. <laughs> I did, and I forgot what I was going to say. Um, what about you then, Tony? I kind of got into it uh, by accident, sort of, because I was uh, through Hans Lug um, and then the podcast and stuff. But actually, I started using Linux and Debian and got people at work into using Ubuntu. So I guess in a most explicit way, that's my contribution mm. the podcast i do because i enjoy it and you're quite good fun a lot of you so Aww. <laughs> Aww. great hug <laughs> no you're right <laughs> i refer you to my earlier comment <laughs> um yeah and i well with the podcast to some extent it just happens to be about bunty yeah if you were doing a but if you'd started doing a podcast on something else on open source probably same effects we talk about on so it's not specifically just Ubuntu. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Can you see yourself or about what about sorry, let's go back, Tony. What about yourself? Why? Um it's a it is a very good uh, question. I initially it was because of I went to open source because of the technicalities of it. You know, you could do what you like with mm-hmm. open source, you can tweak your system endlessly and I was geeky and enjoyed that and I read Richard Storman's theses on these things and oh, you read them oh, yeah. <laughs> it was me you're that guy <laughs> I read the GPL at one point as well <laughs> um, I read the BSD license which version <laughs> two because it was that long ago three <laughs> didn't exist at the time um, and so I kind of got into it for technical reasons but I guess the reason I've stuck around is you know the community yeah. I, I enjoyed Ubuntu as a distro over others because it mostly just worked it worked a lot better than Debian at the time um, and I've just stuck with it because it hasn't annoyed me enough to go anywhere else. Um, <laughs> That's a ringing endorsement of a distro. Well, there are it people, hasn't annoyed me enough. There are people who you know leave distros because the buttons move from one side of the window to another. So yeah. you know, and, and it hasn't annoyed me enough, and I'm still able to do what I want with it, and therefore I've stuck with it. And it's an even more popular platform, so I can get a wider range of software for it, perhaps than I could three or four years ago. Um, but it is kind of I think there's kind of the community and the engagement and. I mean, John O'Bacon's buzzwords will be going off all over the place now, but <laughs> the fact that there are people who listen in to this show, for example, and write in, or I can go to a conference, and even if I don't know anybody there, if I see somebody with their Ubuntu t-shirt on, I can probably go up to them and have a conversation about it. and Get uh, your photos taken with them. <laughs> well, yes, or they get their photos taken with me. You know, one, <laughs> get in. one way or the other. But yeah, so it's it's a, it's yeah. an insight. And, and to be honest, you know, the last year or so, I've kind of... Um, broaden my horizons and things, and have you know, got back into things like Doctor Who, which uh, I wasn't—I have was part of the community a long time ago, but stopped going and getting involved in. And it's not all that dissimilar, really. <laughs> it's just the fact that you can stand around chatting with people who are into that something into the same thing as you. Mm. People who are obsessive are obsessive. It doesn't really matter yeah. what they're obsessive there's, about. There's not a lot of crossover, though. <laughs> no, I'm always quite surprised that there are a, <laughs> a small minority. But yes. Yeah. And, uh, it really just seems like it's as long as you can have a, a conversation with somebody about it. It's like football fans mm. who will sit and talk about how their particular team is doing in the league, which players are doing well, which ones are doing badly. You it's know, like metal fans. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's, it's, just, I, it's commonality cool. that's um, the important thing. When I used to go to the pub before all of this with, <laughs> with my friends, before <laughs> before I was married and, and had kids. This is and, better for you. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> maybe. Uh, maybe not financially. Uh, one of the, one of the, all the my my um, social circle of like uh, real world friends. Um, we used to go down the pub, and they would show me a red card if I talked about computers. In the pub. Uh, and it it would be like they'd pull out a yellow card if it was like getting <laughs> getting close. Did and you then, get to say anything? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If, if it was like, oh, did you see this uh, website? Blah, blah, blah. You know, this was before smartphones and before, you know, you could just pull out a 
phone and show them Wikipedia and answer a question or something. You know, in a conversation, if I mentioned anything about computers, it was red card. Wow. These yeah, are your they friends. Were, yeah, yeah. Right, okay. I mean, it was kind of done in a jokey way, but they meant shut up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, 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 and I, I, I think that's common. I think there are a number of people who are comfortable being in a pub talking about football, but they're very <laughs> uncomfortable talking about anything deeply technical because it's boring. Yeah. Um, whereas mm. I could sit at home and chat with you guys uh, via you know the internet or come to your house and chat about stuff that I enjoy talking about and I don't get red carded for talking, <laughs> talking take, about I've, it I've just take, thought of an idea for next season though. <laughs> <laughs> to, red card Alan see what really got me into it actually was the community stuff um, because I came along to Lug Radio Live hmm. Tony had been the first year and it looked like fun hmm. so I came along the second year a bit shy because I had no idea what was going on but really enjoyed it and went back and volunteered the years afterwards and had an amazing time. And it was just the kind of buzz of it all and mm. people talking. And people, some of it was the kind of unconference thing because it's just so friendly and informal and just free. <laughs> people did it for are, free. They are a collectively nice bunch of people. Yeah. The, the people, and I don't know what it is about, you know, that there are collective, collectively nice people who gravitate towards each other mm. in communities like Og Camp and Lug Radio and, yeah. and also within the Ubuntu community. There are, you know, there are, there are nice people who gravitate towards each other. Okay, there are, you know, people we don't particularly like and they can, they can go away in their own way. <laughs> right. But, you know, we, yeah. we like to surround ourselves with people who we enjoy company with. Mm. And, and just like when we went to Og Camp this year, just walking into the room and people just say, oh, buy your drink, buy your drink. Cause not, not <laughs> I just, didn't get that. Not, yeah, I, I didn't get that But it wasn't just about the drink. It was the fact that you'd walk in and these were people that you saw once a year. Yeah, right. And you talk to once a year and yet you'd be talking to each other like you were best mates. And yeah. It was, mm, it's yeah. just really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Things like Twitter kind of help keep that communication. Yes. During the And during the fact that there's still yeah. a Lug Radio IRC channel long after the, <laughs> yeah. the show is, you know, yes. mort. Yeah. Okay. Well, if you're uh, well, if you are involved in the Ubuntu community, or you know, why not? Well, you are because you're listening to this show. Well, that's what I was getting at. <laughs> um, you can send us a sort of email and tell us why you do it. Why do you contribute? Maybe you don't contribute, and maybe there's a reason why you don't contribute, and you could tell us about that as well. Um, yeah, send us an email or via any of the other ways which we mentioned at the end of the episode, um, and we'd love to hear from you. <laughs> And now it's time for the bit about Ubuntu. Wow, that was a big voice. Mm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The shouting <laughs> trousers on this evening. <laughs> <laughs> um, the Unity team are working on a fix to improve performance for full screen games. That's timely, isn't it? Yes. So this is some clever thing where it says, oh, there's a game that's full screen, I won't worry about compositing then. Yes, basically. Unredirected Windows. Why is it a oh. problem normally? Well, because so there's... directed Windows. Did I say this before? I think I, this <laughs> yes, sounds familiar. Did. Let's not have that again. <laughs> it's basically, basically when, it, de when uh, it detects that there's a full screen uh, app going on, like a game, give over all the resources to that. That, oh, win that window, so you don't bother. So it's doing not still any... drawing a wobbly window in the background, which is eating all of your GPU. Yeah, yeah that's the idea. And because this is coming up for release of Steam, and you know, more and more games are coming out, it makes sense to. And uh, Timo has blogged about it and put a package in a PPA and said, "Hey, go for it, test this." And we found some regressions already. And, cool. Um, we've got some fixes for those as well. So there's going to be a new uh, Compiz and Unity coming for twelve oh four and twelve ten. Oh, cool. right. Okay, so it's backported. Yeah, this is all backported for 12.04 for Steam and 12.10 because, you know, some people have upgraded from 12.04. Very cool. Mm. The Dell XPS 13 Developer Edition, the laptop produced from Project Sputnik, has been released in the USA, I think, and Canada. Oh, well, that's all right then. I think it's your as long as it's in Canada. What's that yeah. all about? <laughs> <laughs> Nicely done. Hi, Emma Jane. <laughs> uh, it's a laptop, uh, an Ultrabook, no less. Yes. Uh, a 13-inch Ultrabook, which was previously uh, part of Project Sputnik, where they would uh, Dell and Canonical got together and built an image for that specific hardware, which is tuned for the hardware, aiming at. DevOps, who currently buy MacBook Airs. And it's mm. also got a couple of cool little tools on. There's the developer profiles thing, mm -hmm. where you can say, I am an Android developer, and it will set up your environment like an Android developer. 
Um, and there's the cloud cloud launcher, is it called, where it basically will create a um, a cloud of virtual machines on your laptop, so you can yes. develop like you're developing on a cloud. Yeah, so you could be uh, offline okay. and develop yeah. your cloud app locally, and then publish it to the, your corporate cloud when you're done. So mm. you get an i7 CPU, an Intel CPU, eight gigs of RAM, and a 256 gig solid state for the low disc. low price of about. It's about one and a half thousand dollars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. fifteen hundred dollars. It's a premium laptop. I mean, it it's, aimed, it's, it's it's like right high end in it's, the. It's not in aimed the at you know people who are buying netbooks. Mm-hmm. It's aimed at people who are buying MacBook Airs. Yeah, that's that's the goal is to win those people back over. Yeah. To to the in, to yeah Linux rather than uh, OS ten. Hmm. Right. Okay, but a nice laptop anyway. Um, I might get one. <laughs> if, so, if somebody gives me one, <laughs> he yeah. won't. Get okay. One. Uh, Metacity, which is a long forgotten window manager, will no longer be included in Ubuntu Images. That's because it's been replaced, essentially. My compass and yes. Nux. Yes. Nux. So I won't still have to look at it and go, Metacity. No, Metacity. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah, we'll never have that problem ever again. We're doing it just for that reason Excellent. that people mispronounce it. That's all. Good. Can we get rid of Linux as well? <laughs> Linux, you mean? Yeah, that's it. Linux. My name is Linus, and I pronounce Linux as Linux. <laughs> uh, Juicy Pakanen has blogged about LibColumbus, a searching library that will allow error-tolerant to- searches in Unity's HUD. HUD. So this HUD. means that if you mash the keyboard a bit halfway through typing what you're searching for, it'll say, "Ah, oh, you probably meant this, so I'll show you the results for this. Mm. Which is quite handy. Yeah. Yes. Probably. <laughs> uh, stats for up uh, there. Stats for app downloads in the Ubuntu Software Center are showing a rise in popularity of Unity 3D games. Mm. Previously, the number one thing people bought was a Minecraft launcher, <laughs> <laughs> and now there's a bunch of games at the top. Oh, nice. And we've talked about this a number of times. Unity 3D now has an export to Linux option, yeah. and it makes it easier for developers to port uh, games to Linux, so they can port them, export them out to Linux, send them to. Um, the software center and sell them. Cool. Hooray for them. Good for people who like games. And finally, not about Ubuntu. <laughs> Matthew Garrett has released his Shim bootloader, which will allow Linux distributions to boot on machines with UEFI Secure Boot enabled. Cool. Yay, and this Matthew. is signed by Microsoft as well. So if it's a Windows 8 certified machine, which is locked mm. down to only boot um, Microsoft signed stuff, it will work on that. Mm. Good work, Matthew. The yes. fact that anybody can download it and install it, does that not effectively bypass the whole point of signed No, because you, you things. basically you have the the key for your distribution on your install media. So you put it in and it runs this shim, which is signed, so that's okay. And then it says you can install a new key for something and you say, all right, install the one off my install media. And then it will check that what you're booting is the thing for that key, which is what you're installing off your install media. So if someone then tries to change that, it won't boot because it won't match the key. So as long as your install media is okay and hasn't been compromised, you're right. Yes. Okay. But somebody can still set up Tiny Sofa Linux and set up their own installer that will install on a Windows 8 machine. Yeah, I mean, they could, they could, inst- I mean, someone could give you a CD with malware Linux on with the key for malware Linux yeah. and say, yeah, just use that key and it will still boot malware Linux and own right. your machine. That's what I was getting at, yes. I think. Yes, but also people can do their own thing. Mm. And at that point, you've stuck a CD in and installed software on your machine. Yeah. It's not some random binary that came in a Java advert you know, in your browser yeah. that's trying mm. to compromise your machine. You physically stuck the media in your machine and did that to it. Right, so you're to blame. <laughs> yes. <laughs> for not checking the SHA-1 sums. Yes. Right. Okay, and that's all the end of the bit about and not about Ubuntu. <laughs> And it's time for the feedback. Uh, Craig Lynch Bloss has been upgrading his desktop and has a question for the community. Which everyone's pointing to me at to read. You're good at reading. Okay. I, uh, no, I can't. I don't know. That should be an A. Oh, okay. Yes. A few Sorry. releases ago, I upgraded my desktop and I have major problems with the result and end up doing a wipe and load. I like the sound of that. <laughs> wipe and good, load. 
<laughs> After an upgrade from 12.04 to 12.10, I am again left with a mostly useless desktop. It looks like the window manager doesn't start correctly. In fact, comp is crashes, and I sometimes get the option to send a report, which doesn't work. I have almost no GUI access, but I can get a shell by pressing Control alt t But if I try to interact too much with the desktop, the whole system will lock up. Ah! Someone scrolled the screen. Sorry. How, how did I do that? Uh... <laughs> <laughs> oh man, what was I? Uh, I can get a shell if I do Control Alt T, but if I try to interact too much with the desktop, the whole system will lock up, and I need to do a hard reset. That sounds unfortunate. Uh, yeah. In my attempt to not repeat the mistakes of the past, I've tried to reach out to the Ubuntu community, but I've not had much luck. When I log into the Hash Ubuntu channel on Freenode, a few hours in the evening here, and ask for help, I may have had a couple of hints, but no real help, and the signal to noise ratio seems quite high. Maybe I live and work in the wrong time zone. UTC plus 13. Isn't that in wow. the middle of the Pacific? Well, I, did, I yeah, looked this up. It's, so. it's, there's a bit in the middle of the Pacific, which is over the international date line, but there's some islands which want to be on the other side. Okay. <laughs> oh, right. oh, I Not know, important yeah. for him. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I've posted a question on Launchpad, Googled and checked that the Unity plugin is installed and enabled. As far as I can tell, it's somehow related to NVIDIA drivers. So what's the best way to get help for someone in my part of the world? So it's not so much. Oh, it is Hawaii. Well, no, I. I oh, yeah. Sorry, I added that. Oh, okay. I, I looked up. So I, th- I thought I'd have a look and see wh- who might have an Ubuntu Loco in that area, mm. and in the middle of the Pacific. In the middle yes. of the Pacific, and Hawaii would be, you know, forward a day, but only an hour forward, relatively, if that makes sense. Right. So. Yes. Um, and there, yeah. So there's a, there's a Hawaii Loco, but I'm not sure how active it is. There's also an Alaska Loco. <laughs> to extremes of the uh, thermometer there aren't they? um yeah but if uh, if you're in a in a mid pacific loco and you'd like to help out craig then uh, uh, yeah craig he's got a couple of good points saying he's, he's tried to put questions on launchpad which are you know answers.launchpad.net oh, yeah. it's a good place to put it hasn't had yeah. any luck uh, well i've seen some people are asking you know for you know more information and uh, making suggestions as to what uh, what and, it could be yeah yeah, and then he's provided information, and then it goes quiet, which is yeah. about my experience of a lot of launch pad threads. <laughs> uh, we need X, Y, and Z. Okay, here's X, Y, and Z. Silence. So yeah. my my first reaction would be um, ask a question on Ask Ubuntu. He's he's said he's googled and found another question that might be. It. I would say create a new one and outline what's been done and mm-hmm. paste whatever logs on Ask Ubuntu, and that would be the best place to do it. Why do we have so many places that people can go for support? <laughs> because people like different things. You know, there are people who absolutely hate forums or web-based things, um, and thus mailing lists are their favourite. There are people who hate real-time chat because they they feel it's a time sink to sit there staring at a screen waiting for someone to reply to them mm. and would rather paste a gob full of text in somewhere and say, here's my question, and then wait for the answer, in which case, you know, mailing lists are for them. And there are some people who just love... Um, web-based forums, you know, crazy though they seem. <laughs> <laughs> so ask Ubuntu, I would go to ask Ubuntu and ask a question and put the question in there and someone will get back to you. Is there a specific IRC channel for graphics help? Um, there is. There's uh, Ubuntu-X, okay. uh, where the X developers hang out. Um, and usually that's a kind of last resort. If you can't get a, a question answered from someone else in the community, you go there mm. Um you know, I've I've done that a few times when I've had, you know, major problems with video drivers. But generally, Ask Ubuntu, I would say, is the first port of call um, because it's pretty high quality and you generally will get an answer. And if you don't get an answer, the really nice thing about Ask Ubuntu is your question will sit there. And if nobody answers it, after a few days have passed, you can offer a bounty for the question or someone else can offer a bounty. And some of your karma, your points that you've got, you offer to somebody else to say, look, I'll give anyone 200 points if they answer this question. I tried that on one of mine. I asked the question, nobody answered it. So I offered like 500 points and then Colin Watson answered it. I was like, yeah, you win. Yes. Who was sitting in the desk opposite you? (laughs) No, no. Okay, well, best of luck with that. I hope you find some uh, some good solutions, Craig. Um, and Chris Giltnane has written in to ask, With more and more games coming to Ubuntu, should or could Ubuntu do more to support mice and joysticks out of the box? So it is special gaming joysticks. Or gaming yeah, mice some of those gaming, gaming joysticks mice. that have like a bazillion buttons and uh, uh, hair triggers and all that kind of stuff. Well, I've, they... got, I've got a gaming mouse which works out of the box. I'm not sure 
Well, I think it's mapping the buttons and all that kind of because a lot of them on Windows come with a um, a GUI oh, yes. that lets you map this button uh, to that yeah. function in the oh, game or to uh, this yeah. keyboard yeah. press. Yes. So oh, you I can see. Like, so like switch. macros and things like yeah, that. Yeah, exactly that kind of stuff right. as well. And so, we, d- we don't. I don't think we really have something like that on Linux. I know someone recently posted a screenshot on uh, online of KDE and the mm. KDE Control Center, which does have a joystick. Thing yes, it's really good with. In. With um, I mean, game pads. Any game pad I've ever connected up. I mean, it's been yeah, a GameCube one and a, a Wii controller, and it and just, just recognizes them. Exactly. Knows what they are. And yeah. You can calibrate them yeah. and all that kind of stuff, and figure out what the buttons do. But um, and in GNOME-based distros, there's a joystick dash gtk app that mm. does the same kind of thing but it's not on there by default right oh, okay and and in there and i don't think it lets you map buttons to do certain things it's nowhere near as comprehensive as the as the apps on mm. windows are so yeah maybe that's a an opportunity someone should develop an app that that actually manages those gaming mice mm. and uh, as he says the more, more games coming to ubuntu then yeah, there's going to be totally. more and more demand for that sort of yeah. thing yeah absolutely excellent well get on that then <laughs> That's all for this episode. Thank you for listening. You can find out how to get in touch with us via our website, podcast.ubuntu-uk.org, where you can find our voicemail numbers that nobody uses, Twitter feed, <laughs> Facebook, and Google Plus pages, and no IRC uses. channel. Phone us, please. <laughs> uh, let us know what you think of the show, or give us your thoughts about Ubuntu, the community around it, how you contribute, and that kind of thing. Join us on Tuesday, the 18th of December, for our next live broadcast, the last one ever. <sighs> And it's the last one for the... Cri- what? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. You weren't listening, were you? <laughs> Only half listening there. Not last to one the last before. one ever, as far as we're aware yet. Maybe. Decisions um, like that have not been made. Oh, come on, we need some you. feedback. But it is the last one before Christmas, so... Yeah, um, if you want us to come back after Christmas, send us nice emails before the next show. I'm sorry, but the world is going to end at the end of December, so oh, here's yeah. the last it's one ever. I've forgotten yes. that, yeah. So, Again? Yeah, the whole kind of Mayan calendar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, that's the end that's of, the end uh, of the world. 2012. So um. we clearly can't be doing an episode if the world has been destroyed. But um, Peter Curry next year as well. Oh, no. Oh, that's quite sad. Um, so, yes. So it is the last one of this season and it's the last one before Christmas. And we usually try and line up something for our Christmas episodes. And uh, uh, yes, we might have something in store. And we're going to go and review our predictions that we made last oh, year. Oh, yes. That's always fun. Seeing who seeing said how wrong we were. Yes. Or in, 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 in my case, right. how right we were. You've already done it. <laughs> Have Maybe. you checked yours? No, I... I remember what his was, actually. Yeah. Save it for the show. <laughs> See you next time. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.